in this lesson, we want to talk about the intermediate value theorem. We also want to look at the upper and lower bound rules. All right, let's start out with something that's very simple. It's known as the intermediate value theorem. And basically this can help us to determine if a zero lies between two numbers. So what we do is if we have f of x against some polynomial function with only real coefficients, and let's say we have two real numbers for simplicity, let's just call them a and b for right now. So if the values f of a and f of b are opposite in sign, then it must be true that at least one real zero occurs between a and b. Now, if you're scratching your head when you hear that or when you read that in your textbook, I promise you in a second you're going to understand. This is a very, very intuitive concept. So let's say we start with something like f of x equals x cubed plus 2x squared minus 5x minus 6. Now, I'm just going to tell you that there is going to be a 0 that occurs between negative 2 and 0. So between these two numbers, between negative 2 and 0, there will be a 0, meaning there's some value that I can plug in for x, and the result of the function or the function's value, if you wanted to say that, would be 0. Now, to prove this, in this particular case, it's going to work out to where you're going to have one of these guys going to be negative and one's going to be positive. So in other words, f of negative 2, if I did that, what would we have? Well, this would be negative 2 cubed plus 2 times, you'd have negative 2, and that would be squared, minus 5 times negative 2, and then minus 6. Okay, so we know negative 2 cubed is negative 8. We know that negative 2 squared is 4, 4 times 2 is 8, negative 8 plus 8 is 0. So you can just erase this. Basically what you have here is negative 5 times negative 2, which is 10, 10 minus 6 is 4. So this is a positive 4, right? So the function's value when x is negative 2 is 4, okay? I can also write this as an ordered pair and say that negative 2 comma 4 is on the graph of this function. Now, we also want to look at 0. So f of 0 is equal to what? Well, I know if I plug in a 0, this is gone, this is gone, this is gone. I'm just left with negative 6. So on the graph of this function would be 0 comma negative 6. Okay. So what I told you was that if f of negative 2 is a positive number and f of 0 is a negative number, well, then there must be a 0 between these two numbers. So there must be a 0 between negative 2 and 0. So graphically, we can prove this. If we go back and look at this point, so we had negative 2 comma 4. So this is my negative 2 comma 4. And then also I had 0 comma negative 6. So that's my 0 comma negative 6. Well, think about this logically. The value of the function here is 4. And let me use a different color because that doesn't show up very well. So this is 4, right? And then the value of the function down here is negative 6. So negative 6 there. Okay. Well, in order for me to get from here to here, as I move to the right, notice that every y value between 4 and negative 6 is going to occur. And that y value includes a y value of 0, right, where we cross the x-axis. And when we cross the x-axis, that's our 0 for the polynomial function. It's going to end up happening right there at negative 1, 0. So that's how this guy works. If you plug in one number and you get a negative, and then you plug in another number and you get a positive, well, then there's a zero between those two numbers. Now, what you don't want to think here, and this is a common source of confusion, let's say, for example, you plug in and you get a positive, and then you plug in and you get a positive again with a different number. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean there's no zero between them. OK, it's just true that if it's positive and then it's negative or you get negative and positive, whatever it is, if there's a sign change, then it must be true that at some point you're going through the x axis. So you will have at least one zero. Let's look at one more quick example of this. It's a very easy concept. Usually the problems you see with this, they'll just give you two values and say, hey, prove that there's a zero between them. So all you need to do is say, what is f of negative six? And this is going to be what? negative 6 cubed is negative 216, then plus, you would have negative 6 squared, which is 36, 36 times 14 is 504, then plus, you'd have 59 times negative 6, which is negative 354, so I just put minus 354, and then plus 70. 
So if you go through and do the addition here, negative 216 plus 504 is 288. If I subtract away 354, I get negative 66. Then if I add 70, I get four. So let's just say the value here is four, right? So one point would be negative six comma four. Okay, so the other one, let's look at F of negative four. So what would that be? Negative four cubed, is negative 64, then you'd have plus negative four squared is 16, 16 times 14 is 224, then plus you'd have 59 times negative four, which is negative 236, so I'll just put minus 236, and then you have plus 70. Okay, to do this quickly, I know that 70 minus 64 is going to be six. So let's just get rid of this and put a six here. And I know that negative 236 plus 224 is negative 12, okay, is negative 12. And I can quickly do negative 12 plus six, that's gonna be negative six. So this guy is positive, this guy is negative, right? So one point will be negative four comma negative six. So because we go from positive to negative, I know that there's going to be a zero between those two numbers. Again, my Y value here is positive four, my y value here is negative six. So at some point between an x value of negative six and an x value of negative four, I'm going to have to cross the x-axis or get a y value of zero. All right, so now let's move on and talk about the upper and lower bound rules. These rules are helpful, again, to just narrow things down. When you're working with finding the zeros for a polynomial function, you have to have as many tools as you can get, especially if you don't have a graph or you don't have you know, a calculator or something to use to help you out. You've gotta just narrow things down as quickly as you can in order to not spend hours and hours and hours trying to find zeros. All right, so if we have a polynomial function f of x with real coefficients and a positive leading coefficient, okay, let me say that again, a positive leading coefficient, then if we divide f of x by x minus k and your k that you're working with is positive, if each number in the last row of your synthetic division is either positive or zero, then you can say that k is an upper bound. This just tells you that you're not gonna have a zero that's above that, okay? You can stop looking. So if you had a list of values, like you generate with the rational roots test, and you test something in the middle, you take a positive value in the middle of the range, and let's say you find out it's an upper bound, where well, you can cut off a lot of numbers, and you can start working down now. All right, so let's see this with this guy real quick, and then I'll show you about the lower bound in a minute. So basically what we wanna do is just do some synthetic division. So I put a five here, and I'm just going to take my coefficients. So one, negative four, negative two, negative three, negative one, and negative one. Okay, so let's scroll down to get some room. And basically what we're looking for is that this entire bottom row has to be either positive or zero, okay? If you have any negatives involved, you have to stop, okay? It didn't work. So this guy's gonna come down. So you have five times one, that's five. Negative four plus five is gonna be positive one. And then five times one is five. Negative two plus five is positive three. Five times three is 15. Negative three plus 15 is 12. Five times 12 is 60. Negative one plus 60 is 59. Five times 59 is 295. Negative one plus 295 is 294. Okay, so that's your remainder there. But again, all you're looking for here is the fact that you have a positive number here, okay? and you had a positive leading coefficient. So if all the numbers down here are positive in the final row here, your results, well, then you know that five is an upper bound. Okay, it tells you that you don't need to look at anything larger than five if you're looking for the zeros of a polynomial function. You would wanna start going the other way. Okay, so let me tell you about the rule for the lower bound. So if your K, your number you're doing the synthetic division with is negative now, and the numbers in the last row are alternating in signs. So it goes positive, negative, or negative, positive. If it alternates like that, zero in this case can be treated as whatever you want. It can be positive or negative, whatever you need, okay? But if this pattern occurs, then we could say K is a lower bound. So none of the real zeros will be below that point. So you can kind of stop your search. All right, so let's go ahead and crank this one out. And I'll show you that this one does work. So this is negative three. 
we'll have three, five, negative four, negative four again, three and negative two, okay? So this is a negative value. We have a positive leading coefficient. So let's go ahead and try this. So I'll go ahead and drop this down. We'll put a three here. Negative three times three is negative nine. Five plus negative nine is negative four. Negative three times negative four is 12. Negative four plus 12 is going to be positive eight. Negative three times eight is negative 24. Negative four plus negative 24 is negative 28. Negative three times negative 28 is 84. Three plus 84 is 87. And then lastly, negative three times 87 is negative 261. And then negative two plus negative 261 is negative 263. So if you had done the rational roots test and you were just checking negative three, well, immediately you would say, okay, this is not a zero, but I know negative three is a lower bound because this guy is negative, okay? And if I look at these guys, this is positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. So it alternates here. So I know that negative three is a lower bound. So I'm not gonna be looking for any real zeros that are less than negative three, okay? Again, the upper bound scenario is where this guy is positive and your whole row down here is positive. In that case, I'm not looking for any real zeros that are above that number.